Let's pray together, can we? Father, as we just sang, we are so grateful that your love endures and never changes. And you promised you'd never leave us, never forsake us. You promised that you'd never stop loving us. And you promised that nothing would ever separate us from you. An amazing promise, promises, the amazing promises you've made to us. And Father, as we come tonight to this portion of Scripture, some more lessons to learn, and so I ask you to speak to us and uh, teach us a little bit more through the life of Moses about our own lives, please, and what you desire for us. So come and be honored as you do. But Father, once again, unless you come, nothing's going to happen. So I ask you to come, and in Christ's name, amen. Well, on Wednesday nights, we've been studying the life of Moses, and we traced it from his birth to where he fled Egypt to Midian because he killed an Egyptian taskmaster there and 40 years in Midian and, and then God appeared to him in a burning bush and up on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, same name, same place. And God gave him a call to go back to Egypt to lead the people out. And, and so Moses, if you remember, he, he objected to that with about five objections or so as to why he should not be the one to go. And God finally said, well, I will send your brother Aaron with you. He's a good speaker, and in fact, he's on his way already, actually. And so then Moses leaves God, and then we, what we've been studying for a few Wednesday nights is that Moses has a series of meetings, God-ordained meetings, and each one is different. They don't, most of them don't cover very many verses, but most of them deal with him heading back to Egypt, and there's a couple of them that we're going to see tonight while he's back in Egypt. Each one has lessons for Moses to learn. Like the first one, he had to go to his father-in-law Jethro, if you remember, and, and ask his permission. God had already told him to go, and out of respect, he went to Jethro, and he doesn't quite tell Jethro the truth. And Moses had to learn, I think, then, or at least we learned through it, that you tell the truth no matter what. But it's also, I think, a matter of faith, and Moses just not trusting God at that point, and, and maybe being unsure that he was in the center of God's will. From there, the next meeting that he had was a meeting with God, and God tells him, he says, Moses, go back to Egypt. He tells him again, and we said there was some reason for that, that Moses seemed to be hesitating. He didn't leave right away. Part of it was his meeting with Jethro's father-in-law, but there was another reason. We saw that God said to him, all the people who sought your life in Egypt are now dead. That, so it may be the reason he was not leaving yet was because he had fear, fear for the people that might seek his life in Egypt, but maybe some other fears. And we learned about fear last week and the fact that uh, what Moses needed to do was just to, in the midst of his fear, stop and ask, what do I know to be true? Same for us. We take our fears. There's nothing wrong. We talked about that last week. Fear is a, a, a natural emotion that God created us with. And that first sense of fear is not what's wrong. It's what you do with it. If you hold on to it, allow it to paralyze your life and keep you from following the will of God as Moses was doing. And what we do is just what Moses should have done, taken what do I know to be true? I know who my God is, I know what he said, and you work your way through your fear, and you move on. And then we move from there on to his meeting with death, which seems to have been, been your most popular meeting last week. And Moses and his family start back to Egypt, and, and they just travel maybe one day, and that night God seeks to kill Moses. We saw the reason why was because he had not circumcised his youngest son. He had circumcised the older son, but he had not circumcised the younger son. And, and so his wife, Zipporah, or Zipporah, Zipporah, depending on how you pronounce it, recognized that it was God seeking to kill Moses. And so it says that she grabbed the flint, cut off the foreskin of the son, and threw it at Moses and called him the bloody husband, meaning the one who causes my children to bleed. And God spared Moses because of that. And we talked about the fact that maybe Moses thought it was a little area. Going back to Egypt was a big thing, and, and, and leading the people out was a big thing, and standing before Pharaoh was a big thing, but maybe circumcision, he thought, was just a small thing. And we learned that there are no small areas with God. What was interesting was um, we talked about that maybe it was because of his wife that she was pressuring him not to... Uh, circumcised this son. And, and I got to tell you a story because I, I, a couple days after that, someone came up to me out in the community and they said, you're Pastor Larry, aren't you? And I said, yes, I was watching you online. And she said, that woman. 
and, and I had to say, well, it wasn't just that woman. Yeah, she was at fault, but Moses was more at fault. And Rick, you had a great comment. Do you mind sharing it with him? He's coming. Put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I wanted to find the, uh, the passage, but it was, I believe it was in Luke 18 where um, the, it's the parable in which the, uh, yeah, you did put me on the spot. <laughs> sorry, Rick. Um, remind me what I said to you. I'm having a... Well, you talked about the fact that if, if we're going to follow Christ, you have to be willing to... Forsake everything. everything. And yeah, that was, it was the parable of the rich young ruler and um, how, um, you know, it, there was this discussion um, between the rich young ruler and Jesus about, uh, you know, doing everything. Uh, but are you willing to forsake, um, you know, your riches? Are you willing to sell everything? And then there's this dialogue that goes on between Jesus and the disciples. And uh, Jesus says, you know, if you're not willing to uh, forsake everything, including family, and that just r reminded me of the encounter that uh, uh, Moses had with, with God in relation to the Zipporah incident. That's a good point. I thought it was a good comment that if we're not willing to forsake everything to follow, even in the small areas, thank you, Rick, that then we're not really following him. It's not just the big areas of life, like going to church or doing this or that. It's even in the small areas of life daily that we have to leave everything behind to follow him. Well, tonight we come to some more meetings with Moses, uh, hopefully three of them, and we're going to see Moses in a little bit different light. It, he's not, we're not going to see him in a negative light, but for the most part in a positive light tonight, but in some different ways. So that leads us to page four in your outline. If you have an outline there at the bottom, and we begin with his meeting with Aaron. And by the way, once again, if you have a comment you want to make, if you raise your hand for just a moment, the young men will come back and they'll find you and let you share. They're going to hold the mic, but they'll let you share your comment. Or if you have a question, you can stop me at any time. I do have some places where I'm going to ask you some specific questions. But a little bit different meeting here with Aaron. Uh, join me in Exodus chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. Aaron is brother. Now the Lord said to Aaron, since there is, he had said to Aaron, it's a past tense, go to meet Moses in the wilderness so he went and met him at the mountain of God, and he, he kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord which he had sent him, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. I'm getting past my verses. I just went verses 27 and 28. Once again, just a, a short two verses here, but I, I think there are some good things to look at, to think about here tonight. And we're not given a lot of information, so some of this we're going to have to think ourselves what might have happened in this brief meeting between Aaron and Moses. A, on your outline, it says God sent Aaron to meet Moses. Verse 27, it, it said, the Lord said to Aaron. The sense there is that he could have just said it, but maybe more likely he gave him a dream or a vision that Aaron was to go out and to meet Moses. And it says in verse 27, he was to meet Moses in the wilderness. Wilderness was a huge area. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of miles. And the natural thing for Aaron would have been, if he's going to go seek Moses, was to go back to the land of Midian. That's where Moses had lived for 40 years. But instead, verse 27 says that he went and met him at the mountain of God, Mount Horeb, and Mount Sinai. And that just lets us know that God's instructions for Aaron as to where to go to meet Moses had to be a lot more specific or involved in here in verse 27 it tells us in other words god was guiding every step of Moses of aaron as to where he was to go otherwise he's going to be heading to midian and moses is not going to be there he could be heading over here I'm, what i'm trying to say is god was just directing aaron's steps and verse 27 says that moses and aaron met at mount horeb and mount sinai same place which was about a two days journey for moses from where jethro lived and that's where he had left to go on this journey back to Egypt. So Moses had just traveled a short distance. He had not been gone long. He'd had the meeting, the delay of the meeting with uh, Jethro, but he had also waited there for a period of time. Aaron, on the other hand, traveled much farther and made great haste to meet with Moses. If you go back and you read in Exodus chapter 4, when 
God finally in anger, he's angry at Moses for all his objections, and, and uh, uh, he, he finally Moses says to him, uh, send someone else to speak, and, and God, says, well, God says, well, your brother Aaron is a good speaker, and, and, and I will use him, and he's on his way already. So God had already started Aaron upon his way, and Aaron's people have suggested they have maybe have had up to two weeks to travel, which in a way tells you a little bit about how long Moses may have stayed in Egypt. Maybe a week, maybe longer. He's hesitating to leave. And then in verse 27, they meet Moses and Aaron and notice that they kissed, kissed on the cheeks. A common practice in those days, a common practice in many countries of the world today. Plus, think about it. It's been 40 years since Moses and Aaron had seen each other. Can you imagine that meeting after 40 years apart? What they had to be like. Imagine what it had to be like for Aaron when God said to him, I I want you to go meet Moses. I mean, he had to be so excited for this meeting. Well, they come together, and number one on your outline there under A, verse 28, Moses told Aaron all that God had said. The word all there is a Hebrew word that means every last one, every last word that God had said to Moses, he told to Aaron. And then verse 28, he also showed him the signs, or told him about the signs that God had commanded him to do with that staff, that shepherd's staff. And that caught my attention because I thought, imagine Aaron, he's hearing this for the first time, and and Moses tells him all the words, and he talks about the signs that he is to perform, including that shepherd's staff that is going to turn into a serpent again. And Moses probably told me, he probably said, you know, God told me to throw it down the ground. It became a serpent. And Aaron's probably staring at the staff. I just picture him staring at the staff in wonder and trying to figure it all out because it's just a shepherd's staff. And then number three on your outline there, Moses obviously told Aaron that he's going to be the mouthpiece for Moses. Now imagine this. Aaron and Moses sitting down and having this discussion and Moses sharing all of this. All these words and all of this. Remember, this is the first time Aaron really has heard it. This is really the first time that he had heard all these words. And so they sit down, they have this conversation, and Moses probably told Aaron about the burning bush. And Aaron, I was just up on the the mountain with the sheep, and there was this burning bush, and I started over towards it, and the voice of God came out of the bush and told me I was on holy ground and to take off my sandals, and Yahweh revealed himself to me. And then Moses probably told Aaron about God's call upon his life to go back to Egypt and to lead the people out of bondage. He told him everything. And by the way, this is the first time it's written that Moses had told anyone about his experience with God up on that mountain and God's call. Oh, it doesn't say he told his wife. I'm sure he told her some things. It doesn't say what he told her, but he didn't tell Jethro anything. Imagine what this had to be like for Moses to tell Aaron to tell anyone for the very first time about the burning bush, the voice of God, the call of God upon his life. What do you think that was like for Moses to tell it? It's not a question I'm asking you. I'm going to give you my opinion, and then later on you can tell me. I think for Moses it had to be thrilling. You know, I think he had to be thinking, let me tell you about this. I mean, when God does something in your life, don't you want to just tell somebody about it? You can't wait to tell them. But imagine seeing a burning bush and the voice of God speaking to you. I think he couldn't wait to get it out. So I think it was thrilling for Moses. I I think it was also a relief to get it out. He's got this heavy burden on him of, I'm going back to lead the people out of Egypt. And and I, I think he couldn't wait to finally tell someone this this whole trip, this whole journey he's going to have. But I think it was also dangerous for him. Would Aaron believe him? Remember, he was afraid the elders weren't going to believe him. I mean, imagine telling your own brother about, hey, I I saw this burning bush and it didn't burn up and the voice of God spoke to me. What if Aaron didn't believe him? What if Aaron rejected him? 
Imagine what it had to be like for Moses. On the other hand, what do you think it was like for Aaron to hear all this? Now I will ask you a question. So, what do you think it was like for him? Deborah. Got to hold your hand up for just a moment for these guys to see you. He probably was intimidated by everything. Intimidated? Why would he be intimidated? Because you're speaking on behalf of God. Ah, Good. So... I would be intimidated. And, and this is probably the first time he's heard that, that he's mm-hmm. going to be speaking for God. Good. Mm-hmm. What else do you think it meant to Aaron? How, how do you think it hit him? What, what was going through his mind? Please, he's coming. Or you can tell me, use I repeat it. But okay, I think he was thrilled because Good. he's getting part of the action. Thrilled because he's going to have part of the action. Right. Good. Why else would he be thrilled? I think you're right. I think he was thrilled to have a part, any Israelite would. Why else would he be thrilled? Just let's focus on that word thrilled for a moment. Why else would he be thrilled? They spent their whole life in slavery. They, sl- they spent their whole life in slavery, and now after all these hundreds of years, God's going to bring them out, and for any Israelite to hear that word would be thrilling. You're exactly right. So it's intimidating, it's thrilling. What else would it be? Any other thoughts? David, right here. I kind of wonder if there'd be any apprehension because he knew Moses as a man on the run who's a wanted man, and now he's going to be associated with him going back into Egypt. Yeah, David said he's going to be going, well, you already heard him, but he's going to be going back with Moses back to Egypt. This same Moses who killed somebody, who Pharaoh put out a hit on him, basically, he gave an order to be killed. And what else is Aaron going to do that would be kind of dangerous? He's going to do what? Well, he's going to be standing up before the, before the king and, say, yeah. and saying, hey, this is what he said, not me, is what he's going to be saying. <laughs> uh, could you see him saying this is what he said? <laughs> yeah, he's got to go back before Pharaoh, and he's got to say, you know, God says, let my people go. And as we'll see later tonight, Pharaoh says, who is God? It's dangerous. His life is on the line. So it's, in, it's intimidating, it's thrilling, it's challenging, it's dangerous. But you know what caught my attention here with Aaron? This is the first time he hears this. But what do you not hear from Aaron? Any objection. There's no objection. There's no, no way, Moses, I don't believe you. There's no, I'm not going to be the one. There's no what ifs. Now contrast that with Moses. When God told him, I'm sending you back to Egypt, he came up with all kinds of objections. And yet Aaron doesn't. And you've got to admire Aaron for that. I mean, later on, Aaron really blows it with the calf at Mount Sinai and the worship there. But don't you admire Aaron for this? I mean, it's got to be amazing how God prepared his heart for this when he doesn't know all the details. I don't think he knew all the details because it says there that Moses told him all the things, all the words, meaning every word, and you get the sense with that, at least I do, he didn't know everything. Rita has, if you don't mind. No, but you got to use the mic for the... Um, but as, like you said earlier, you know, God told Aaron to meet Moses there. So it's like, okay, I'm going to this place, and I don't know where I'm going. It's in the wilderness. And so he, he had to be ready to hear something amazing. Because God had already sent him to Moses. He did. He had to be ready to hear something Aubrey over here is, oh, there, I got you. Wait a minute. He had to be ready, and God had to prepare his heart, I think. God had to make him ready to hear this message, be ready to fall through with it. Aubrey, what do you have, sir? I want to go back to Aaron and Moses <coughs> meeting together for the first time after 40 years. There had to have been something about their relationship before, back 40 years earlier, where there's a sense of, you know, of character, a sense of them knowing each other enough to know when one is lying, when one is not lying, when one is, is sharing something that's just really unbelievable. But it's coming from Moses. Hmm. It's coming from my brother. I have a brother, and he and I have a relationship. And after Vietnam, I'm getting back together. There's something about our relationship, how we grew up, that automatically so, bonded us together. So, and we could talk about a lot. So I, I want to think that with Aaron and Moses, there had been something about their path together 
that would cause him not to really want to doubt what most of us sharing with him. So you think it was also not just that God was preparing his heart, but also there was something in their relationship. I want to come back to their relationship a little bit, not as younger brothers, but now and what Aaron would supply for him. Can we come back to that in just a moment? Thanks, Tim. Well, it's interesting, just that contrast here. B on your outline, what's interesting to me is what's not mentioned. It's not mentioned, if, number one on your outline, did Moses share, what did Moses share of his experience with God at the burning bush? Did, I mean, it doesn't tell us what it was like. He, he doesn't say what it was like, or, you know, I mean, he doesn't tell, it doesn't say here they told Aaron what it was like and everything that he felt and all of that. Number two, I wondered, did Moses share with Aaron his objections to God and the reason for Aaron being needed? Do you know what I mean? I, I, most of us are prideful people. And we're not going to admit our weaknesses and our failures. And I, I wonder if Moses was like that. If, if, if he didn't share with Aaron, you know, Aaron, I, I just objected to God all over the place. And I had all these things. And God finally got angry at me. And he said, well, I'm going to use your brother Aaron. I wonder if he was honest enough to admit his weaknesses. Number three, I wonder, did Aaron sense a change as Moses from 40 years earlier? And Aubrey, maybe that goes back to their relationship as brothers. Now, 40 years later, you wonder, did he, did he sense something different? Not that he was older. I mean, he's 40 years older. But did he sense a change in his heart? And I wonder, number four, what questions or concerns did Aaron have about being the mouthpiece? I mean, we think the call was hard upon Moses to do this. Think about Aaron. He has, he has not had a burning bush. He has not heard the voice of God speaking from that bush. And you just, I, I just wonder if maybe Aaron had some questions or concerns and it doesn't come up here. See, I, I think it's interesting, if I can go back to that, how God prepared Aaron's heart for all this. How much did Aaron know ahead of time, as, he's, as readers saying, as he's heading out there? I mean, how much did he know? Or was it just a complete trust in God to go? Well, D, and, and this is, Aubrey, where I was thinking about with you. What would Aaron supply for Moses? Do you know I mean? I, I, what would he supply that Moses greatly needed? Think about some things. Companionship. Well, let's start with one. Companionship. Someone to go through this journey with them. And that's important, isn't it? Because when you feel alone, his wife has just gone back, many think. He sent her back, back home to Jethro, and so he's all alone. So companionship is greatly needed. Secondly, you said encouragement. Why encouragement? What part is a rough road? Okay. So encouragement in what sense? Just, uh, I'm sorry, you're supposed to for the uh, <laughs> online. Okay, I, I believe um, to assuage his fears that he wasn't the only one going through it. Okay, so someone that uh, understood what understood, he was... Maybe understood this burden. Yes. Good. What else? Yeah, Ken, right here. Also, Aaron had been through slavery. He had been through all of that, so he would be like experienced as far as helping Moses to with the people. So when Moses goes back to the people and he presents himself to the elders, then Aaron could help them understand that slavery, they could identify with Aaron. He's one of us. Good, we'll come to that later on. What else would he supply? Why confidence? Right here. She said confidence. I just can't help but think that Aaron had the confidence to, and he didn't have the fear, and he didn't question like Moses, because he had the benefit of growing up with Jochebed, and Jochebed had to put Moses in that river, and you don't see where she hesitated, but she had the confidence that God would take care of, would take care of him, and I can't help, you know, there's the saying that says, there's more that's caught than taught. You can teach your children, but if they, if they, you model it before them, I would think that they, from that, would maybe build the confidence in them that God is going to take care of you no matter what. So because Aaron had more time with his mother, is that what you're saying? I'm, 
yeah, and watched Moses her put was, a Moses into that. Moses maybe in the water. was had some of that, but he also was influenced. Okay. Um, That's by, an interesting question. We'll have to come back to that when we come to why he builds that calf. Well, I'm not, I'm not I questioning. Mean, I, I think got, you're right. I, I, I'm just. Everyone th- within him has the the ability to fall, but that point in time, I think that he had the confidence that his mom. That is, his mom modeled in front of him. Good. So every one of us has that capability, don't we? Yes, we do. Interesting. What else would Aaron supply for him? We have someone over there. A knowledge of the land. Yeah, he would supply a knowledge of the land, wouldn't he? Now, Moses would know some of that because he had been in Egypt, but he would supply a knowledge of the land. Interesting. And he had just walked through that land that they're going to walk through as they come out of Egypt. All the Israelite people are going to come through there. Thank you. Anything else he would supply? Aubrey's right over there. Again, going back to the relationship, I think Aaron's supplying to Moses legitimacy. That if this guy says this, he's telling you the truth. I know my brother. If he's, if he's just walked out, Trust me, I know him well enough. To, he's not lying. He's telling the truth. Hmm. So I think there's some legitimacy. Again, again, relationship, things like that over so, the years. I think so. So that's thinking that or saying those words or portraying that, I mean, just think about what that's going to do to Moses. Here's someone that believes in him. I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with right. you. Well, you know, he's going to supply someone to walk through this process with. He, he's going to supply someone to carry the burden. He's going to supply an encouragement. Someone who understands the Israeli people and their slavery. He's going to supply a lot for Moses, isn't he? And, and you know what? You need something like that in life, don't you? We all need that. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, listen to verses 9 and following. It says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls where there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can, if one can overpower him who is, who is alone, two can resist him. The cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Yeah, th- these are verses that we use at weddings. But they speak of a friendship as well and the need to have somebody in life that walks with you through life and shares the burden that you're carrying and shares the ministry or the call that God has placed upon your life. Proverbs 17, verse, 9, verse 17, I think, or verse 19 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. For someone there when you're going through tough times. But this brings up a question for us. Who's walking through life with you? Who's sharing your dream? Who's sharing your burden? Who do you share with when... The call or the task before you seems overwhelming. See, I think Aaron could also, Moses could say to Aaron, you know, Aaron, I'm just afraid of this, and and this seems overwhelming to me. Who else is he going to say that to? To his wife? Maybe. But he doesn't want her afraid. So who is he going to share that with, that sense that it's overwhelming and he's afraid? you got to have somebody in your life that walks with you. I, I mate, you got to have that mate there. I, I don't mean you shouldn't. But I think there's got to be someone in our lives that we can share our fears with and, and someone we can say, you know what, I, right now I'm just struggling right now and I need you to pray for me. Or right now, you know what, I'm just carrying this burden. Interesting. So that's his meeting with Aaron. What do you think? What stands out to you about that meeting? Anything stands out to you? Any thoughts there? To me, I think it's, for me, it's Aaron's response. That just strikes me there, that, that lack of questioning or that lack of, of, of you know, that, just that belief. Okay, let's go. And maybe, Aubrey, it's because he believes in his brother. I don't know, maybe it's a faith in God. Maybe it's all those things. But anything that stands out to you. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next meeting then, because the next meeting is a meeting with the elders of the Hebrews. And once again, just a couple of verses here. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 29 to 31. Would you turn there with me? Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord has spoken to Moses. 
He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and they worshiped. Now, it may, not, it may seem like there's not much here, but I think there's some things we can draw out of this portion of Scripture. A, on your outline, Moses and Aaron meet with the elders of Israel. They, they wasted no time, it seems, once they got back to Egypt. They gathered all the elders of the Israelites, it says. The word elders is a Hebrew word that literally means beard. <laughs> and so it's talking about the older men that were there. The heads of the tribes, the heads of the families, the clans, the, the wise men, the, those that were seen as leaders in the Israelite community. They gathered them all together. And if you can imagine, I'm just in my mind imagining this, imagine all these elders gathering together, probably staring at Moses and Aaron, and wondering why they've called them to gather together. You know, what did Moses and Aaron want? And probably a little suspicious. Why would they be suspicious? Why would they be suspicious? Because they had never experienced this before. Okay. They had never experienced this before. What else? Why would they be suspicious? Think about Moses and Aaron. Ken. They knew who Moses was. No. They knew who who was. Moses. No. They knew Aaron. They didn't know Moses. We're going to come to that. <laughs> they knew Aaron. He had lived among them, but Mo not Moses. Remember, it's been 40 years. And many of the elders had died in that time. The ones who probably knew Moses. And if any of them were still alive, what did they remember about Moses? He was what? He had been raised by the Egyptians, so he's a what? He's a, he's a traitor. Because he saw the affliction and the bondage that the Israelite people were in as slaves and he did nothing about it from his position of power. So many of them, if they were still alive, probably thought he was a traitor. Plus, he was the one that they had rejected, remember, 40 years earlier as their leader. And for those elders who did not know Moses 40 years earlier, they had probably heard stories about him, and now here is this man standing right in front of them. And what does he want? Well, number one on your outline there, Aaron is the speaker, and he told the elders what God had said. That's what verse 30 says. And God and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. So who told him what to say? Moses did. And what did he say? He says, all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses up on Mount Sinai. And I wonder at this point, do you think Moses mainly, maybe, Wish he had not told God to have someone else speak? You know, I mean, at this point, I mean, it's easy when you're up on Mount Sinai, you say, God, get somebody else to speak. Now he's standing before the elders, and he has to tell Aaron what to say. So Aaron tells him, and I just have this feeling that Moses is thinking, man, I wish I had not said that. Well, verse 30 tells us that they also performed the signs. It said he performed the signs. And when you see that word, he, the natural thing, is to think it's Aaron and maybe Aaron did, but I think it was Moses. Because I doubt Moses would have given up that staff to anyone yet at this point. Plus, God had told Moses back in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 17, you shall perform the signs. So I have a feeling it's Moses. It could have been Aaron, but I have a feeling it's Moses performing the signs here. What signs did he perform, by the way? Do you remember the three signs? A rod turned into a what? And a hand turned into what? Leprosy. And water turned into blood. So Moses did the signs here. Later, both Aaron and Moses will perform the signs and wonders using the staff. And later on, both of them are going to be speaking. In fact, Moses is going to take on a major part of the speaking. You're going to see a great change in Moses. Notice number three on your outline the elders responded by how? 
believing. Interesting word there in verse 31, that word believed, it, it means to trust. It means to be quiet. It means to have no objections. So what did they believe? What did they not have any objections about? That God was going to deliver them out of Egypt, and what else? That Moses would be the leader. No objections. Why did they believe? Interesting there, I'm asking a question on that one. Why do they believe? Um, because they trusted Aaron. I don't know if... Don't you think Aaron was instrumental in bring, turning the hearts of the Israelites back to God? Oh, I, I think they, as, as uh, somebody has said, Aaron was, they could identify with him as mm -hmm. a Hebrew, and I, I think the fact that he was with Moses certainly made it easier. Mm -hmm. But it kind of tells us here some reasons why they believed, and then there's something else. Why did they believe? The signs, because of the signs, which is interesting. He performed the signs. Now, what's interesting, Anthony, is back in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, Moses says, I don't think they're going to, what if they don't believe me? What if they say God did not appear to you? And God says, here are some signs to perform. And if they did not believe you, then they will believe the first sign. If they do not believe the first two, they'll believe the third. So what does that tell you? about them here. Kind of, I'm not making that, I'm not giving you a lot there. Oh, oh. If he had to perform the signs, then what does that tell us? Does that tell us that maybe they hesitated at first, believing? So that Moses had to do the signs. Remember, God said, Moses said, they may not believe me. And God said, well, here are some signs to perform if they do not believe you. And so it seems to indicate that very possibly they didn't believe him at first, or Moses just wanted to perform the signs so that they would say, yeah, he's of God. But yeah, the signs certainly had a lot to do with it. What else had a lot to do with it? Well, they had been promised to be, been promised to be delivered. Okay, they had a promise that one day they, God was going yeah, to deliver so them, and been maybe they remembered the that promise yeah. through the, their ancestors that God was going to deliver them one day. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Look there at verse 31. What else made them believe? I'm sorry? What the Lord had said. So it's because of the word of the Lord that they heard. Yes, they're believing because they heard God's word, what he, he, he said to Moses. Moses passed on to Aaron, Aaron passed on to them. So it's the word of God. And there's one more thing. Concern. Who said that? Thank you. When they heard about God's concern for them, the word concern means to take note of. When they heard that God took note of them, Moses apparently passed on. Remember, God had told Moses several different times, I have seen the affliction of my people. And the sense there is that to see with a, a sense of feeling, not just I know about it, but it really had hurt God to watch his people suffer. And I have seen them. I'm going to bring them out. And so there's that, when the people, the Israelite people, the elders heard that, those words, that God was concerned, that God took note of them, it led them to believe. Isn't it great for you and I, when we read the scripture, that says that God takes note of, of us, that he sees us, and everything that we go through in life, Amazing that the God of the universe with billions of people in this world and tomorrow, whatever you and I go through, God says, I see that. Not just I see, but I feel it. And I think finally, I, I think God just prepared their hearts as well so that they would believe. And notice what they did next, number four in your outline there. It says that they believed and then they bowed low and they worshiped. The word bow means to bow down and worship. And the word worship there actually means to prostrate themselves down before God. It was a sign, a symbol of submission to God and to his will and to his word. What an amazing picture that provides for us. All these elders, the leaders of the Israelites, 
prostrating themselves on the ground before God, symbolizing their worship and their submission to God. And I wonder, I wonder when the last time was they had done that. Do you remember back months ago when we, we looked at the Israelites in Egypt and we looked at their gods? Do you remember what we talked about when God brings them out of Egypt? What message does God send to the, say to the people? Put away what? The gods that you worship back in Egypt. They worship the Egyptian gods. That's why Aaron forms that. He's a hero tonight, but the, down the road, he's going to be the one that helps to form that calf out of gold that they worship. And I wonder, for all those hundreds of years, part of the reason God did not bring them out was because, I think, of their worship of other gods, but also they never cried out to God. It wasn't until they got to the point where they were so desperate they cried out to God. And, and so I wonder when was the last time that these Hebrew elders prostrated themselves on the ground before God and worshiped him and submitted to his will. Well, number five there on your outline, the elders had responded just as God said they, had said they would. He, he told Moses that they would believe him back in Exodus chapter four. And I asked the question there, number six, what do you think that would have done for Moses? What do you think that would have done? Deborah. Um, given him more faith in, in God to believe in him. Why? I think you're exactly right. Given him more faith in God to believe in God. Why? Because he promised it to him, and he fulfilled his promises. So he's watching. He's saying, God's really going to do this now. <laughs> Interesting. Good. What else? What else would this have done for Moses? I think it would have taken a big fear off of Moses. Why? Big fear off of his shoulders. What was this big fear going back to Egypt? It wasn't Pharaoh. Rejection by the elders and the people. That was his biggest fear going back, was that the elders would reject him. And now that fear is gone because he sees these Hebrew elders, and you know what? They believed him. They believed that he was, God was going to deliver them, and they believed that he was the one that God was going to use. Good. What else would it have done? I think it would have made him relax going to Pharaoh. Why? Oh, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead, tell me, and I'll say it. No, you know the people will back him, back him in hope. The, the Israelite with, with, he was with him. He knows they're going to back him up now? Yes. So he's going to relax because he knows that they're with him and they're in all this. They're behind yeah, because him. Because he doesn't want the people to say, oh, you are doing that by yourself. We're not living here. We're staying on Egypt. And so, now he knows the people are happy that they are leaving and he feels more confident to do it. Yeah, as I was saying, you know, you know your, your leader of people are following you. She's done. She's, tr she's trying to tell you she's done. Um, and, and, and if you think you're a leader and nobody's following you, you're just taking a trip. So now he knows. He's got the Hebrew people behind him. They're ready to go. Why else would this help him to relax with Pharaoh? Because if God can what? Do this with the elders, he can change Pharaoh's heart. If he could change the elders' heart, then certainly, you know what, he can... He can change the, the, the Pharaoh's heart. What, I mean, what an encouragement it had to be to him, and it had to help him relax and all this. And, and, and you know what? I, I think after this, I think Moses is sky high right at this point. I, I think he's on a spiritual high, an emotional high. I, I think he's just thinking to himself, let's go before Pharaoh. And I think the elders of the Israelite people probably are thinking, you know what? Things are going to go very quickly and very smoothly when we meet with Pharaoh. We're just going to march in there, you know what? And we're going to say, God says, let us go. And Pharaoh's going to say, sure, you go. Realistic? No. So that's a, their meeting with the elders. What are you thinking? What stands out to you about it? Anthony, uh, it's, it seems like, like Moses 
fear was bigger than God, but now you say, yeah, let's, let's go before fear. You think, he, you think his fear is gone now? It seemed like God did so much. And my question is, why is he still so fearful? I don't think he's as fearful now as he was. Yeah, yeah I know, but you said that. I, I think he might. My be. opinion. Yeah, yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. But do you think his fear at one time was bigger than God to him? I think his fear is bigger than his faith. Not bigger than his God, but bigger than his faith. But those go together, don't they? So in some ways, his fear is bigger than his God. Isn't our fear bigger than our God sometimes? I think so. Who said a little while ago that we all, it was over in here, that we all are capable of falling? He did. We all are capable. We all have fear. We looked at fear last week. We all have fears. Let's be honest. All of us in this room do. And all of us in this room have times when we do not trust God. You look at me like you're the only one. I'm not the only one. We all have fears. We all have times when we do not trust God. It's not that God has changed. It's our fear that makes that that way or makes that difference. I think what we're going to see in Moses is as time goes on, there's more and more of a faith in God, more and more of a boldness in God. As Aubrey likes to say, he, he hasn't bought into it yet, and he's buying into it now. Moses, talking about Moses. I think, no, 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 I, I'm just quoting him. Sorry about that. Isn't that what you've been saying? Moses hasn't bought into all this yet, but he's buying into it. So you know what? The more he buys into this, that God, this is what God wants him to do, the more he sees God working, the bolder he gets. And as you're going to see in the coming weeks, he becomes a very bold man until Pharaoh says, who is God? No, I'm not going to let him go. And he makes the work even harder. And I thought we'd get there tonight, but we didn't get there tonight. And when Moses sees that God suddenly is not working as he thought he would, and the people are hurting, he says, why did you even send me, God? You have not brought them out since I came here. And once again, he goes back to that fear. Why? Because God's not working the way that Moses thought he should. So, I mean, I, I think there's some great lessons here. Just because we think we're walking in the, in the will of God does not mean there's not going to be struggles. And just because we are, have God with us does not mean that we are not going to suffer. But it does mean that there's a God who works and fulfills his word and his will, just like he did here with the elders. And can I tell you, I, I think you hold on to those times when things are going well. And you thank God for them, and you let them encourage you so that when things get a little tough, like he's going to have with Pharaoh in the coming weeks, you hold on to him and say, wait a minute. Man, if he changed the hearts of the elders, he could change this guy. If he does this, this in my life, you know what? He can handle this down the road. It's interesting, the lessons of life, aren't they? See, I, none of these meetings are, what's the word, um, by chance. I, I think they're all ordained by God to teach Moses and to encourage him and to build his life. Just as in your life and mine, God brings the experiences into our life that we go through to build us up, to encourage us. Other thoughts tonight about these meetings? Pastor Ed, they say you don't need a mic, but <laughs> I, I am struck by the elders bowing down and worshiping. Doesn't that get to you? And I think it's contingent upon the promise that they were all holding on to. That's um, a good point. That came from Abraham because God had told Abraham, I'm going to bring them back. But for, you know, for 400 years, your people are going to be oppressed. And then it says in Genesis 15, then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It's in a sense that God was dealing with the other nation and ready to judge them and giving them opportunities to repent and concerned with them. And now they realize he's now concerned with us. Good. And it's for freedom, it's for liberation, and we get to go back. Good. Yeah, I'm just, no, I, I think I'm just right. wondering if that's what compelled them to fall down and worship. And I was thinking about what you had said. I, I wonder if they thought, you know, this is the generation. This is the time. And maybe this is God coming through Moses. 
which then makes me think, you know what? We live in the last days. And maybe we ought to think this is a time when he could come back and we ought to be living. But it, that's what struck me too is the fact that they prostrate themselves on the ground. They didn't just say, Moses, okay, we're with you. There's this prostrating themselves on the ground in worship and submission to the will of God. It's interesting. Anything else? Ken and then David. Um, God's patience with Moses. He, um, he knew what Moses needed in order to become who God wanted him to be. Good. God's patience with Moses, and he knew who he wanted him to be, and it pays off, doesn't it? Because Moses is, is a changed man, and he keeps on changing, just like us. He's patient with us, and David's right behind him there. And he builds into our lives, preparing us. Last one, David, go ahead. I think there's an interesting dynamic parallel to follow here. We, we have the obvious challenges of godly leadership, but we're also going to run through the challenges of godly followership. Hmm. Because sometimes it's not easy to follow when things don't go like they had expected either. So you're saying that the Israelite people weren't good followers? I think they went through the same challenges we do. (laughs) They were awful. They complained the whole way. I'm going to talk about them, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday, and their following and their attitudes. It's interesting. Well, some things to think about for our own lives. Pastor Ed, do you have some people to pray for us? Gentlemen, thanks again for running tonight. And... If Pastor Ed would come and the people he's asked to pray, and oh, let's pray together. Can we, as they come, just pray silently with me. Just bow with me. You know, a couple of things come to my mind tonight, just thinking about us for the pray about, and I just think about Aaron's attitude, first of all, and What an amazing attitude to not complain, to not raise any doubts. Just, okay, if that's what you want, God, let's go. Well, if you'd be willing to pray with me, just silently right where you're sitting and saying, God, tonight, whatever your will is for my life, let's go. Just bring it about. I wonder if tonight, just as you're praying, if you think, I, I, I think it was such an encouragement to Moses, the elders' response. And What can you look back on your life tonight and the hand of God as he's moved in your life over the years that you could just even remember right now and just say, man, there was this time, and I just remember that. What encouragement that was to me. I wonder if you just pray with me and say, God, whatever tomorrow brings, maybe life doesn't go the way I want or maybe it will. May I walk very simply, trusting you and seeking your will, no matter what may come tomorrow.